I'm going to bring up Vice Admiral Brian Brown, Commander, Naval Information Forces, our type command. All right, thank you. I got two microphones, it's awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, some of you haven't had a brief uh, uh, induced loss of consciousness, so you're, you're actually able to be here. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about where we've been over the last year uh, in terms of our enterprise. Uh, and where we're heading in 20. And then to compare and to contrast a little bit, um, when I talk about the enterprise and what we're trying to do at the enterprise level as compared to what we're trying to do down at the TICOM level, which are, they're intertwined, and I want to talk about that a, a little bit. Um, it's been a busy year for us uh, as we've stood up the enterprise. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, really proved over the last year that it does take... Um, a broad assembly of, of stakeholders to get after the challenges that we have across um, all of our stakeholders. It's taken not only a collective team of folks at the resource sponsor level, the acquisition level, um, across the, the multiple TICOMs, because I can't do it alone as a TICOM, um, but we've also had industry partners in there, academic partners and others that have helped us uh, really push forward uh, information warfare um, uh, in the fleet. You know, this is not a nice-to-have information warfare. It's an imperative. Uh, if you sat in and listened uh, to the service chiefs this morning um, or listened to um, the Don CIO lunchtime, if you had that opportunity, or if you just kind of look out where the Navy's going, um, sometimes while not explicitly talked about it as information warfare capability, um, we are certainly intertwined in everything that the Navy is doing right now. You hear, you know, we, we talk a lot about, of course, this whole conference is about great powers competition and where we're heading. Uh, the Navy's concept of operations uh, in a great powers competition is distributed maritime operations. This is a new way of war fighting at the operational level of war with multiple strike groups, multiple amphibious ready groups. But when you think about the core pieces of distributed maritime operations, the ability to maneuver the force, the ability to operate the force in a distributed fashion across a large battle space to create dilemmas for an adversary, but all at the same time remaining integrated as a, as a one fighting force. You can't do that without exquisite knowledge of the environment. You can't do it without exquisite knowledge of the, the red side and, and we, when we're in a, an ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance versus counter ISR environment. You can't do it without being able to communicate, and you can't do it without being able to bring asymmetric advantages we have in soft kill capabilities and non-kinetics. You just can't do it. And all those things I just described, that's information warfare. And so my hypothesis is we can't do distributed maritime operations in a prolonged fashion without bringing wholeness to the information warfare capability that the Navy has. And that's been our singular focus over the last year and try to take what we have across a very broad enterprise of IW capabilities and stitching them together in an integrated fashion, pushing them forward in an integrated way to get after the Navy's most pressing challenges in the two plus three environment or the GPC. So I hope that as I go through this and I talk about where, where we have focused our energy, you will see the connections to um, delivering a capable force today to fight today's potential challenges, but also looking at the future of where we are going uh, to do things better. Um, I look forward. Um, I look forward to sharing this with you, and also, um, and I guess I have control of the, the things. Um, uh, answering your questions at the end, and I realize, and I talked to my guys. I'm not sure this. This is the slot I had last year, and as I recall, this is the slot right before all the beer and wine comes out. So. Um, we got that going for us. So last year this time, um, I introduced the concept of, of the enterprise, information warfare enterprise. Um, we had taken our lessons as we had as started growing up as a, as a new TICOM, and I can't really use the term new anymore since we're five years old, so we're kind of, we're kind of in that uh, uh, infant you know, or toddler stage of, of TICOMs uh, compared to my other TICOMs. But we looked across how the other enterprises were structuring themselves, and we we, um, um, well, we copied uh, the way that they do business um, because it structurally for the, the Naval Aviation Enterprise, for
for the, and for the surface enterprise, for the expeditionary enterprise, and for the undersea enterprise, uh, this worked well. We focused our efforts on, on readiness. Um, and one of the, we made several attempts after the information warfare enterprise in the past, uh, but we kind of got lost in terms of all kinds of things and didn't have that singular focus on generating readiness. And so we've really focused heavy on that. Um, a year ago, I would have said, you know, that um, our purpose was to serve as the integrated voice of Navy IW, working with fleet stakeholders to ensure the right capabilities are developed and delivered. And we, we did that across these three lines of effort, if you will, uh, ensuring IW readiness, advancing capabilities, and aligning and integrating IW. Uh, the key to our, our enterprise structure, though, was to keep our executive committee small. Um, there were those that wanted to join and expand our executive committee, but we've kept that purposefully small. Uh, for those that were here this morning, you heard from um, uh, Admiral Becker. He's a key member of that as kind of representing the acquisition side of our business. Uh, Admiral Kohler will be up tomorrow on a panel um, to talk about uh, where we're going from a resource sponsor level and then me down at the TICOM level. And these are the three actuals. And we get together um, a quarterly or so with the information, warfare, actually we get together monthly now, um, and we tackle uh, a lot of different problems. But where we really have empowered things are across that board of directors. And there's a lot of integration that happens between our enterprise structure and especially the surface and aviation enterprise structures. There's a lot of synergy that happens across there. Because the information warfare platform um, doesn't just exist within the things that I have administrative control over, but they extend over into the, the surface and aviation platforms. And without that tie to ensure wholeness from a float to a shore, we can't really bring the IW capabilities and wholeness to the fleet. What I can say over the last year is that we've been able to maintain a really steady battle rhythm of regular, of, of regular board of directors and regular XCOMs, and we've taken on some of the Navy's largest problems. Um, I can't talk about all of them because of the nature of the, of, the, of the conference today. I wish I could share all the different areas we dove into, um, but I will share a few of them with you um, that I can uh, at this level. So over the last year, we had these focus areas uh, in 2019. Um, one of them was to mature our, our metrics. Um, as, a, as a type commander, as an information warfare enterprise, we knew that we had to get into the data and start looking at um, um, from, from a lot of different angles. When you think about manning, training, and equipping, um, the interrelationship between all three of those things, especially from an information warfare perspective, across oceanography, across intel, across uh, cryptology, uh, across uh, um, information professionals, networks, uh, com uh, comms, and then across our space part of our enterprise. Um, getting after our biggest problems was really started with getting after our, the data that we had and making sense of what we, what we had. So we spent a lot of time uh, working on IW metrics. One of the things that we invested in last year um, through uh, uh, NAVWAR uh, and their Fleet Readiness Division was something we call Ra RAVEN. It stands for Readiness Analytics and Visualization Environment. We knew we needed to develop essentially a data lake of authoritative databases that we could pull from in, a, in a, an intuitive way to start looking at the data that we had. We focused the enterprise heavily initially uh, with this effort uh, towards the afloat readiness equipping uh, things at, on the fleet. Uh, both fleet commanders, uh, Admiral Grady, Admiral Aquilino, um, in their own way, both told me that our readiness of our, of our C5I systems in the fleet was not up to par to what they wanted. Uh, we took that very seriously as an IWE, and part of the way that we started to get after that problem was understanding what the problem really was. And so through Raven um, and some investments we made uh, through the FRD, we've been able to assimilate about 30 different authoritative databases into the same common data lake with an ability now on a manual level to pull up uh, views of readiness across the fleet. Um, and in a short period of time, once we get through the ATO process, it will, it will provide a user-defined way of looking at what the user wants in order to, uh, in order to uh, look at that readiness. Um, as I, start, as I sta stated, it started with equipping in the fleet, um, which started at the level of trying to understand why we weren't getting uh, systems operational validation tests for the individual systems we were installing 
and then the systems of systems operations test, the SOTs, um, why they weren't getting completed on time. Um, I can tell you after we started implementing the data and started looking at it, we started understanding at a, at a deeper level across the enterprise what the real barriers were uh, to getting those done. Some of it came with personnel. Do we have the right personnel on scene when the, when the, tests were, or the, the different tests were taking place? Um, did we have the right satellite accesses, right? The, down to simple things like that. Were dependencies that went down to um, uh, other legacy systems, were those in place? And did we have those right before we tried the, the test? I, I can tell you after uh, implementing this and starting to work at it, we improved our, our SOVOT, the validation testing for the individual installs, and we've improved our SOTs uh, and we're up close to the, uh, above the 90% first pass yield on those, which was up from about a 60 to 70% first pass yield a year ago. That's real readiness in the fleet, and we're seeing it um, as Admiral Aquilino and Admiral Grady are asking us not to leave redundancy on the pier. We're working with the SWO boss and the air boss. Um, our ships are deploying relatively CASREP free, uh, if not CASREP free, we're getting them there. And, um, and their readiness to do and, and work through the, the major portions of our, of our training uh, portions through basic, advanced, and integrated phases, they're much, more, they're much improved because of the effort we've done here. Um, we want to extend the use of Raven to a lot of other things. The CNO in his, um, in his Frago uh, for the, the Design for Maritime Superiority 2.0 in his, in his Frago 001 uh, directed 10th Fleet to implement cyber dashboards. And so um, at that perspective, uh, we're going to use, uh, we're going to use uh, the Raven is actually the engine that we're using to drive those cyber dashboards uh, that we're going to be providing to the fleet. So a lot, lot in there on Raven. That's kind of interesting, right? I hear the clicking. Now I know what everybody's looking at. Um, we're also going to use Raven internal to um, inter internal nav I4 to get after some of the things that we do uh, in terms of providing uh, direct support teams to the fleet and other areas. So there's a lot that we can do with this, uh, with this Raven system. Um, Raven's closely tied with another program called Noble, if you've heard of that, that's also uh, being developed. Um, the, two, the two systems are going to be integral to some of the efforts that Fleet Forces is pushing forward as they look at, at uh, fleet readiness and some of the changes that they're making in a broader perspective uh, in, that, in that aspect. Under C5I campaign plan metrics, um, part of this effort, which Raven led to, was getting after understanding across the entirety of 13 different lines of effort uh, that we have ongoing, um, how we can improve wholeness across the entire C5I enterprise. Um, key to that was trying to, to develop um, and, and follow the perform to plan uh, process that OpNav has developed, um, which you may have heard about that's led to uh, uh, force generation for um, tactical aircraft under the Air, Air Boss's uh, line of effort that's uh, moving forward in, in uh, making sure that ships are in and out of maintenance on time under the SWO Boss's effort, uh, similar things under the undersea, uh, undersea domain. Our particular effort uh, to, to map out across uh, various different lines uh, was our C uh, 5I campaign wholeness plan. Um, we have mapped out uh, within, these, uh, within these 13 lines of efforts, uh, we've mapped out complete outcome driver trees and, and have implemented metrics uh, that are now starting to drive us uh, uh, towards potential barri barriers across a large swath of information warfare um, uh, challenges. Um, some of those areas are in personnel, some of them are in training, some of, are in, some of them are in design, working with PEO C4I and PEO IWS. Some of them are looking at the interfaces between uh, C4 systems and the combat systems and how we, um, how we improve, uh, improve that linkage, uh, uh, which is a natural direction uh, that, we are, that we're heading towards. So a lot, a lot going on in that, in that vein. Under shore modernization governance, um, I'm proud to say that after much effort, um, we produced, for the first time ever, a five-year modernization plan for our shore infrastructure uh, from a C4I perspective. Um, yeah, that's, that's it's actually a big deal. Um, it, took us a, it took us quite a lot of work in my N4 team to get to a place where we could tell uh, the majority of the, uh, the commands ashore that make up a portion of that IW enterprise, or that platform ashore, 
when they were going to get things and how they were going to get things so that we had some predictability for our, short, our shoreside commands. Um, that was no small lift by a, a large group of folks, um, but this year we actually published a plan for the first time um, and pretty proud of the team and, and the, the effort that they put into that. You'll see in our next year plan, we continue this theme uh, on uh, shore modernization um, as we are going to collectively get into the maintenance side of the business, which is, uh, um, uh, which is a challenge. Under fleet integration, lots of things going on. As I said, the, the first year was really focused on how we, how we integrate IW capability into the fleet and how we improve that. Um, one of the homegrown things that came out of the C5I campaign plan and that we put underneath this fleet integration moniker actually was homegrown here uh, with a group of uh, folks in my, uh, my NAV I-4 West team. Um, recognizing the need to uh, buoy up our information warfare commanders afloat to help them with their readiness across the strike groups and the amphibious ready groups. Um, my team got together and, and put, put together a plan which was endorsed both by uh, fleet forces and pack fleet and came out as a standard message where we are meeting now with the complete set of stakeholders um, at key points throughout the optimized fleet response plan to make sure that our IW teams afloat, which are comp comprised of organic forces and capability that sits inside the ships, so they're our man trained and equipped by the SWO boss and the air boss, um, and the things that we push out to sea in our direct support roles so that we make sure that they are, are getting the uh, individual unit level training and then team training and then inside the, the lifelines of the strike group or amphibious ready group training that they're, they're completely ready to go. Um, the team out here uh, uh, put together the first uh, set of, uh, of um, uh, plans and we are now hitting every strike group and every amphibious ready group as they go through the cycle. Um, Paul, how many, we got a couple this month, right? Who do we got? We got Nimitz coming up, we got Macon Island, Essex as well. Um, and so we are, we're hitting a bunch of them. Um, really, really good work. We're staving off problems ahead of time and, and integrating uh, much sooner in the process. We hit them during the maintenance phase so they can transition. We make sure they can transition out of the maintenance phase and into the basic phase training. We hit them at uh, during basic phase training, right before they go out and do their SWAT, which is their Surface Warfare Advanced Team Trainer. Um, we get them again one more time as they're going, uh, before they go out and do their composite warfare exercise um, to make sure that they're ready to go. And then we hit them right after deployment uh, so that we capture all the lessons learned. Uh, it's, a, it's a full course uh, of man, train, and equip, so we cover everything uh, soup to nuts. Um, and that's been well received by the fleet. I think we're, we're, we're heading off challenges um, ahead of time uh, to include things that, that reach back to the shore, and shore side of the, the platform. Next one down, uh, while it seems a little bit maybe a little bit trivial after, in the after fact, um, defining what we mean uh, collectively from a resource sponsor, from the acquisition side and from the TICOM, but what, what we mean by an IW warfare platform and then how we treat that platform was actually not a trivial task to get to uh, to get to consensus. Why, why is that important? Well, when we describe readiness of a ship, a submarine, an aircraft squadron, we can, you know, it's, it's pretty easy for um, the folks that are briefed on those to understand what that means in terms of wholeness. They can see something, right? It floats, it flies. Maybe it goes underwater, doesn't float uh, as well as you want it. But um, it was hard for us to describe what we meant by a platform in terms of information warfare. Um, and so, um, because we've come to that construct, we are now able to work um, in, in terms of baselines, uh, predictability on future modernization, linkage back to the PORs, how we think about things. Um, so this was a big, it was a big deal for us. It may seem a little bit trivial, but we um, actually have an IW uh, platform definition. And if you look at NAVWAR and how NAVWAR and PEO C4I are looking um, at the C4I side of the house, they're starting to um, you know, talk about not individual programs of records, but roll-ups roll into baselines of the information warfare program so that we can describe to the fleet how we are rolling things out collectively, and then how that then feeds back into the, the shore side of the enterprise, which has many of the same systems. So it actually was really important for us to get there. Lastly, under fleet integration um, is this idea of legacy systems um, reduction. I mentioned in the Raven piece um, that we found a lot of dependencies 
uh, to being able to successfully modernize our platforms uh, because, uh, because we had structural problems relating back to legacy things that may, may not be funded, may, not, may have been orphaned along the past. Um, we have a large fleet. It takes us a long time to recapitalize that fleet. So some of the fleet has some older systems that as new ones come along, they naturally just kind of get neglected. Um, we shine the we we, we uh, took out the flashlight because we started finding this in the data, and we we shined a big light on it. Um, we uh, put together a divestment board. Um, out of the divestment board, we we we're con contracting across the uh, the various uh, PEOs and through the Syscoms to take ownership of these legacy systems to start looking at how to properly phase them out, how properly maintain them if they need to be maintained. Uh, and so we're digging deep in there uh, as a, at an enterprise level to ensure success as we modernize. The other thing is we don't want to continue to modernize uh, with legacy systems in there that we don't intend to, to maintain. Uh, so I think it's been, a big, it's been a big effort for us. I tell you, the, one of the hardest parts about this process was the first investment board that we had. We brought up about 20 or so um, legacy and orphan systems out there and then went right down the list of which ones to get rid of. And you know how many we identified, that board identified to get rid of? Zero. So we said, okay, start again. Um, and so it, this is one of the, the most challenging things for us to get through, um, but we're starting, to, we're starting to knock that one down. And lastly, this last year, uh, under, un, under the IW training continuum, we continue to make a lot of strides um, uh, uh, with uh, the Navy Information Warfare Development Command and our Information Warfare Training Group. From an enterprise perspective, what I'll say about that is our relationship with both, um, with both the uh, Surface Warfare Development Group and with the uh, Strike Group 4 and 15, which those are the training elements that put the strike groups and the ARGs through their paces uh, at the, during the basic to, to advanced phase and then from the advanced phase and the integrated phase of the optimized fleet response plan. Um, in both those cases, we've been able to partner and provide assessors and trainers um, alongside our, our uh, teammates at SMITIC and also at uh, CSG 4 and 15 for the assessments. And that's proved to be um, a, a good thing for both sides as we're ensuring that we're, they're delivering through that process uh, combat-ready, battle-minded IW forces. Um, it's also been a place where we've taken our first few crop of warfare training instructors that we are, or weapons training instructors that we're developing through the NIWIDIC, and we're putting them out there as assessors uh, with the C Strike Group 4 and 15. So that's proved to be a, a really good thing for us. So in 20, um, these are, the, uh, these are the, the, the four areas that we've identified for 20 that we're focused at. And you can see there's similarity, similarities to 19, and that's because the work continues. Um, We've changed a few um, to reflect some of the areas that we want to get after. Um, and the first one you can see there is, is um, we've, got a, we've got more of an eye at trying to get after decision science, not data for data's sake, but data for decision sake. Um, and we continue to flesh out and mature, mature our metrics. And this year's focus is to get out of just measuring measures of performance, but going after measures of effectiveness. Um, and that's a for anybody that's ever done that kind of business, that's 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 a that's a tough lift, right? How do you how you get after that? But um, we've got a number of efforts, including getting Raven to FOC, getting user-defined uh, views in, into the hands of fleet users, and then ringing that system out to see what we can do with it. Um, under shore material strategy, um, we changed that slightly. One of our biggest goals is to get um, not only our basically get governance into the system. Uh, for anybody that's dealt with, a, with any of the other platform enterprises, uh, when you build a ship, you build an aircraft, you build a submarine, you get essentially class maintenance plans uh, out of them. You know, they're designed from the get-go of how often you will replace and, and do maintenance on, 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 um, uh, on uh, different aspects of that. When we built our communication stations, when we built our information operations stations, when we built our fleet weather uh, capability, when we built our intelligence uh, centers. Um, none of those were built purposefully with that in mind of how we would maintain and modernize them. We, we just don't have that um, governance structure in place. Um, 
we are working towards putting that governance structure in place so that we can bring and normalize that portion of the platform in the same way that we're viewing the, the a flow portion of that platform. And guys like T-Rex down front want me to do that because he wants to know what his maintenance, long-term maintenance plan is and his long-term uh, modernization plan and how we're governing that so he can be operationally effective and know when he can take things on and offline um, uh, to be able to do maintenance in, in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. We actually have a couple studies ongoing. Uh, we're being, uh, we're being hit, helped through this process. Uh, those were poured out soon and we hope then from that we'll, we'll know how to do the governance of that. Or we'll see how the, the governments will line up. Um, we have some, uh, some material issues to work through in terms of how each one of the different portions of our enterprise view, view it, um, but I'm, I'm confident that we will get there this year and that's, that's our big goal. So if I stand up here next year and don't tell you that we made it through the maintenance and modernization governance process, then I have failed and I guess I'll go home. So, um, fleet integration, um, we continue along, um, we continue uh, maturing that piece of it um, this year's focus, uh, since we focused heavily um, last couple years at, uh, at C5I readiness and the equipping, which I think we're on track for, we focused heavily on producing information warfare commanders at the strike group level. Um, we've started to pilot information warfare commanders afloat at the amphibious ready group level. But I think this year our big, is our big year of how do we do information warfare um, at the operational level of war to get after that distributed maritime operations piece. Uh, we are partnered as a type commander uh, with the overall mock, uh, Fleet Mock Standardization Council, which is kind of the TICOM for Maritime Operations Centers. And I'm working uh, personally with all the uh, Maritime Operations Center directors and their N2, N39, and N6 staffs uh, to kind of put together how do we do an integrated I IW, cap how do we have an integrated IW capability at the operational level of war to include how do we get after the hard topics, which are space and cyber integration, from, from basic planning, uh, targets, and those kind of things uh, through execution. Um, if you read the CNO's um, uh, Frago uh, that, he put to, that he put out, he challenged our community in two areas in that. One is, to, um, is for the fleets to actually pilot during large-scale exercise 2020, which happens in May, pilot an information warfare cell capability inside the mock, uh, which will be a first, and so we're, we're well on track there as an advisory role. And the second thing he challenged us to do was look at service retained cyber capability uh, and in the form of a small tactical cyber team. And uh, that, is, that is underway and ongoing as well. And um, we hope to pilot that and on the far side be able to report out what that might look like. Uh, so some interesting things going on in fleet integration. Um, and in the I, IW training continuum, um, one of the big parts that we're executing this year is our alignment into um, ready relevant learning. So we have um, uh, currently, not every one of our IW ratings uh, will fall under the ready relevant initial uh, tranche because of some of the joint dependencies that we have um, uh, with the other services and training. But those that we can, we're, we're on track for. Um, we currently have uh, modernized content for for our uh, intelligence specialists and uh, how we're training intelligence specialists along uh, to be a, a kind of um, uh, uh, you know good good analysts, and then some of those will come off the analyst track and go into the targeteering track. So we we have that uh, laid out nicely. That content's been converted, and, and the first classes are going through that now. Um, we also have on the t on the on the docket uh, for content conversion. Uh, and modernizing the content is for our CTMs, which are our maintainers on the CT side, and also for our ITs. Um, lots of discussion will go on this year as well uh, from the IT perspective as we uh, continue to throw more at the ITs, including uh, being really good uh, uh, defenders of their network and really good spectrum operators. Uh, we're looking hard at how we, how we um, uh, take this group of uh, smart young sailors and give them all that they need in terms of modernized and uh, training. Uh, the last piece that we're looking at in, in uh, IW training uh, is really in, in um, live virtual and constructive uh, training environments. Um, if you heard me in the other panel over there this morning, one of the real challenges we have in getting to LVC is that much of our IW capability 
uh, exists at higher classification levels than maybe the fleet operates on natively. Um, and so this conversion from a, high to to, from a higher level of classification down and how we integrate that into the current LVC structure has been probably one of our, our bigger challenges. Um, we are gaining um, ground. We have a few programs in our information warfare training group uh, which have virtualized um, some of our EW training capability and we're leveraging that to train the fleet and, and work, uh, uh, work the fleet up in EW. And um, if you've not been around, I got a great, uh, I got a great um, um, uh, demonstration this morning of our Canes uh, TVE uh, training virtual environment, I think is what it stands for, uh, uh, that uh, has been put together. Um, the pilot's out there, it started in January. I think we're going live with classroom training. Um, but it's the first time, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, promise in how a virtualized training environment might work. Uh, a sailor can come in, log into a machine pretty much anywhere, um, get, get access to an instructor who will dial them into their version of Canes, whatever it happens to be, and it goes out to the cloud. It, it, it replicates all the various servers that are part of their Cane server stack, and then it feeds it back to them, and what they see is exactly what they will see on their ship for their Canes variant. And then that instructor can take them through the paces, can take things, break things down, have them run through it, and they can, they can be anywhere. You can put two people next to each other, one on a 2.0, two 3.0 stack, and another one on a 1.0, 1.0, and they can, they can do the same training. We've never been able to do that before. In fact, what we did was we had an older version of Canes, which nobody had in the fleet. We ran, we ran kids through shift work on a system they would never see, and then we'd send them out to see and start all over with OJT. Uh, now we have a real chance to start at the very beginning with the system they will see, and training them the right way. Pretty excited about that capability. And so how does that all match with, uh, that's, the, that's kind of the enterprise view that we're taking uh, between the resource sponsor, um, the, the acquisition side, the other uh, fleet stakeholders include the other TICOMs, um, the, training, the training apparatus, that's kind of the big flick that we're trying to pull together. But internally, I have a TICOM to run that I'm, I'm looking at. So, so how does my strategy match with the IWE strategy? Well, you probably notice a lot of things that are very common in there because uh, very selfishly, a lot of that strategy that we have at the IWE level, um, I put in there because I'm being selfish because I need it inside my TICOM to do the TICOM responsibilities that I need to do, uh, both for the ADCON mission and then my fleet assigned missions. Um, you can see the bookends of this are really come from the CNO. Uh, CNO has charged all of us. Uh, mission one is fleet readiness. It's the fight tonight piece. Uh, that's the going in position. Uh, we do it, and we've, we've maintained the same lines of effort, strengthening the fleet, advancing the enterprise, and, and normalizing our processes so that we can, we can talk to the fleet commanders in the same way that the other TICOMs can without glazing their eyes over uh, and thinking that we're some kind of uh, enabler because we're a warfighting function that they need to think about as a warfighting function, not a, not a bolt-on capability. So we need to be able to talk and, and like the other TICOMs do. Um, you can see my lines of effort, and the, the, the top one is the one that I don't talk about a lot uh, for probably obvious, obvious reasons, but that's my no-fail mission. Uh, and some of us in this room, T-Rex again, <laughs> um, down front, uh, there's, uh, we, we can't fail at that mission, and so we work pretty hard at it. Um, there's a lot of work that's going on because we always have to modernize, and like anything else, we have to make sure there's cyber, cyber security is there. So a lot of effort going on there. Um, you can see under delivering readiness, um, some of these same things that, uh, that I've talked about. Um, you see some extra acronyms in there. If you're not familiar with the Deployed Group uh, Systems Integration Testing Team, that's DGSIT, or the Strike Force Inter Interoperability Office, that's CFIO. Um, and I, and I, I gave you the construct of the uh, Information Warfare Readiness Continuum that we had last. There's a linkage between those three things. This is how we kind of grade the fleet's homework. The IWRC we put in place to make sure that the fleet had what they needed through the various stages of the optimized fleet response plan so that, that we can ensure their success. But we kind of, and then our Strike Force interoperability team, our East and West Coast subject matter experts um, who know ship systems and can help the, the strike group commander down understand their systems better. Because based on the complexity of the ship's systems, there's sometimes not always easy to see how everything ties together, and those are my fleet experts to help them 
uh, help them work that, at that. And then we grade their homework at a unit level and then an integrated level during the uh, deployed strike group interoperability testing, which happens right before, um, or right during their group, their group sale when they come out of uh, uh, the basic phase. And that's to make sure that all their systems work right, not only internal to the ship, but between the, between the, stri the, the ships because of variations out there. Those three efforts were not linked before. Um, they were kind of independent entities. Uh, we've spent a lot of time linking them together and, uh, and that's paying a lot of dividends for us, so I'm pretty proud of that effort that those teams have done. And then uh, under IW Readiness, one of my big internal things is to make our direct support forces, the, 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 the cryptologic warfare, the, the uh, intelligence, um, the um, uh, meteor meteorology and oceanography teams that we send forward to augment the strike groups and the ARGs, um, that we normalize how we do individual unit level and team training across all three aspects of it. So that I can report out to the fleet commander, just like the surface and, and aviation TICOMs, what the readiness of IW team three on the, on the Nimitz strike group is. Um, today, I have a hard time doing that, but we're, we're uh, moving fast to be able to use data, again, out of Raven and some of these other things, uh, to really give the fleet commanders the health of the teams that we're sending forward. Uh, we're increasing lethality. I mentioned a few of those things. I mentioned LSD 2020 um, and some of the things we're doing at NIWIDIC and IWTG. Um, we are, as I mentioned, piloting the IW commander on the ARG level. Um, that's going well. The fleet's asked for it. It's now a requirement that I've got to somehow turn into reality, and we're, we're doing the last pieces of, of, how, of who pays for the billets, and how we're going to grow that. But um, that's, that's uh, close to being there. Under the enterprise portion, and one of the big things that, that came about this year was um, that's, that's different than, the, than the, uh, um, the other IW enterprise is that when we first built um, the IW community uh, back in 2009, the center point of all that, because we didn't have a TICOM, was our resource sponsor. So for a long time, our resource sponsor, Admiral Kohler now, was our, the head of the community, right? Did all the... Did all the uh, all the, all, all the things that, that go with uh, leading a community, community culture, um, personnel plans, the, the, the things that we do with the personnel system, um, our accessions, our uh, promotion plans, all those kind of things that you do, we're all centralized at the resource sponsor. Uh, this year, as the TICOM matured, Admiral Cole and I have made that transition. Uh, and so now the TICOM is normalized, just like the SWOBOS, Airboss, Undersea, Lord, whatever you want to call uh, uh, Admiral Cottle, um, we now look like, like them. And so when it comes down to community management and other issues, the TICOM is, is in charge now, which is a, which is a positive step for us. Um, and it, it will, I think, over time uh, help us with uh, maintaining our, 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 um, our developmental efforts of the IW as a, as a larger community. And then you can see down at the bottom, uh, a lot of focus on developing ta talent. I mentioned a few of those. Uh, already. Uh, the only thing I'll leave you with there is um, space um, is, is kind of our big, uh, our, a, a big area that we're working on right now. Um, as Spacecom has stood up, there's new requirements that are coming uh, for the fleet um, to support Spacecom. Uh, as the Space Force has stood up, um, we have supported Space Force stand-up uh, with a few billets at the headquarters um, as a temporary loan, but there's still some uncertainty about how that will completely flesh out once the, once the Space Force opens up for lateral transfers and other things. So we're gearing up for that. Additionally, at the operational level of war, we're missing space expertise that we need to be able to pull all those pieces together. Um, one of the things I'm working on right now um, with uh, Chief of Naval Personnel um, is the potential of having a small space designator uh, within the Navy um, so I can professionalize the space cadre force that I've been been unable to completely get my hands around because I deal with 23 different designators all with their own, with their own um, career paths. And so um, we're making progress there. We're going to report out in the next week or so um, of what that might look like in, constru in construct to the CMP. And then we're going to move it forward in the month of March to the, to the CNO to see where we can, where we can go with that. Um, but I think that's the right thing for the Navy uh, in, in a small number. Uh, when I mean small, it's going to look like small, like the cyber warfare engineers or the PMPs, small numbers, you know, under 100, 
uh, probably when we're done. But we'll see where that goes. Uh, but a lot of effort going on in, inside the, the TICOM to get after that. And so with that, I am done with my comments. I'm open for any discussion that you want to have. Um, I will, for anybody from the media, I am immediately after this doing a, 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 about a 30-minute uh, media roundtable in, media, in, in one of those rooms back there. It's number three. Um, uh, so I, I will have to kind of slide fast out of here because I'm going to do that. Um, but I, I will be around for the next, uh, uh, you know, this afternoon during the beer and wine pieces that we have. And then uh, also tomorrow I'll be wandering around. So if you don't get your question out, don't catch me. I will be around. I'm not going to disappear. So I have, but I do have time for questions. So anybody? They all want beer and wine. I know how this works. I'm are honest. you a plant? No. Honest. I know. So Virginia and I are old friends, by the <laughs> way. So that's why I asked for that. I just wanted to ask you, sir, if you could elaborate a little bit more with respect to the shore modernization and specifically kind of some of the installations we have globally and how you intend to improve those. Okay. Um, sure. So the question was about um, a little bit of more depth in the uh, uh, C5I modernization plan. So we, we have a number of different types of, of commands, right, obviously, that are, that are broken up. So what we, in the, in the plan that we worked, we looked at type classes, if you will, between communications, between weather type of activities and those kind of things. And then based on ship and, for example, things that you're familiar with on the comm side, as we looked at shipboard modernization and what was going, you know, what was going to the ships, we then looked at the shore infrastructure and all those things that need to be, run a knock, run a comm stay, and then how those would be in, par in pace with those. So these are modernizations of, of uh, RF suites, of ADNS, um, those kind of things, right? But we had to look wider, you know, um, installations of DCGSN in our, in, um, for, the, for the Intel enterprise. Um, uh, most of it had to do with C, the, the C2 side of the house. Um, yeah, some of the things that we're putting into our NIOCs, for example. Um, but it's, it's kind of, it, it is global. So it's, it's global by kind of class of platform, if you will, and then what capabilities. And, and a lot of it has to do with making sure that we're in pace with the fleet. So as they modernize, we modernize. And of course, a big piece of that is also the N NC3 architecture. Is that helpful? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you so, thank you so much for uh, being part of the IW Pavilion. Uh, hopefully, you've been able to go back and, and talk to some of the folks uh, behind. There's lots, of, lots more displays this year, um, and, uh, and hopefully you've had the opportunity. I've looked at the engagement zones. It looks like they've been fairly well um, used, and so um, uh, please, please avail yourself of that. I'll stand down here if you just want to come chat afterwards, and uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our presentations for today. We invite you back tomorrow for three other presentations.